word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to guide my way. Welcome back to our study of the second coming of Jesus, or welcome if you found these videos for the first time. If you missed the beginning of this series, I put a link right up here. In the last few videos, we've been examining the foundational passages that are supposed to prove the rapture doctrine. The first two fizzled out, and we're down to the last one, so let's get right to it. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, is the next passage that is cited as a foundational passage. And it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I'll leave that up and let you kind of soak it in. It says nothing that might even imply a rapture, unless you read that into going, be with Je going to be with Jesus. However, that is exactly what is taught by the remainder of Bible believers who do not teach a rapture. Obviously, this text also provides no evidence for a rapture event. That's three texts that are supposed to be foundational, but which do not actually uphold the rapture. So why is a rapture event so strongly argued? I'll let those who defend it have their say on that. Many arguments have been advanced in support of the pre-tribulation rapture viewpoint, and as many as 50 can be itemized. Two important presuppositions, however, are essential to the pre-tribulation position. Number one, the definition of the church as a separate body of saints distinct from saints of other ages. Number two, the doctrine of a future tribulation of unprecedented severity. So, as many as 50 arguments can be had, but two presuppositions must be proved before the arguments can be valid. Well, that's helpful. Now, instead of pouring through 50 arguments, we can examine the two presuppositions. If they're true, then there may be something to this rapture doctrine. But if they are not true, then the 50 arguments fall with the presuppositions. Incidentally, J. Dwight Pentecost agreed with this line of reasoning. Now let's begin with the second foundational presupposition, which demands a doctrine of a future tribulation of unprecedented severity. Many Bible texts are sewn together to make this seem irrefutable. Just a few of these would be Deuteronomy 4, 29 through 30. Now it's used and it's clearly about a return from the Babylonian captivity that will eventually carry them off. That's clearly seen by the context beginning in verses 25 through 28. Another is Jeremiah 30, verses 4 through 11. Walverd cites this passage as one of the most important Old Testament revelations on this. He spends a lot of time attributing this prophecy to a future tribulation when it's actually in context the Babylonian captivity from which these people would be freed. Daniel 9 verses 26 through 27 is used, but does not apply to a future tribulation. It actually deals with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, as I've shown in the video that's on the upper right of your screen. This also is the subject of Matthew 24, 15 through 30, but is misapplied to a future event, even though Jesus said it would occur within that generation, Matthew 24 and verse 34. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 11, is a magnificent picture of Christ's second coming, but is hijacked for an application to a great tribulation. In fact, We've already established the connection between 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5 in the video that I'll link on the upper right of your screen. Passages are taken from the book of Revelation and applied to proposed events in our future, although the book of Revelation clearly says that those events were near in the first century and that they would shortly come to pass at that time. That's in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. 
This practice of sewing Bible passages together, which don't belong together, is condemned by dispensational authors as they tell us how the Bible should be interpreted. However, they do it an awful lot to defend this doctrine. We're out of time for now, but next week we'll discuss the other important presupposition which defines the church as a separate body of saints distinct from saints of other ages. This point is actually quite huge. If you haven't subscribed yet, then I hope you will do so. Ring the notifier bell. That way you'll be notified when this video comes out.